if and so oh. it's uh, uh an answer a uh, tape message just played in my ear that this mess that we were being recorded so i hesitated for a second um yeah so but i used to rescue dogs from kill shelters uh when there was a lot of high kill in our area that's not going on currently and uh so i switched to cats when i saw there's such a dire need for cats in my in my area in my region of dayton cincinnati southwestern wow. ohio Lisa, we're, we're honored that you're sharing this space with us and uh, offline, I'd love to connect with you as well to see if there's other resources that we can connect you with. And what I love the most about your conversation uh, is words are so important. And when you adjusted that narrative about, you said those kill shelters, but life-saving is actually happening in our community now that, you know, the more that we can yeah. speak to each other and support each other, uh, the closer we're going to get to success. So uh, we really appreciate that you're here. Are there any other new folks on this call at 801 AM Pacific Standard Time? Give it another minute to allow you to use the chat or to just unmute and introduce yourselves. Hey, Bobby, we're going to introduce you oh, to our hi. newest programs coordinator, taking Shelby's place. Yes. Hi, my name is Rachel. I'm brand new to Cabot Animal Sport Services, but I'm super excited to be working with them and, and seeing all your beautiful faces. Hi, Rachel. Uh, where did you come from? What were you doing prior to joining Cabot? So prior to Cabot Animal Sport Services, I actually worked in parks and recreation for about six years. So still kind of doing outside stuff, but now I'm, uh, now I'm going from people to pets. So it's really exciting. I love it. Well, you're going to be pretty surprised that you're going to be going from people to pets and people, which is yes, really people, exciting about the work that we're doing. All so good it's such a pleasure to meet you. And I'm sure uh, we'll get some time to catch up over the next few weeks. Yes. Uh, anyone I'm Marlia, else? I'm Marlia Edinger from Chicago, the Treehouse Humane Society. I'm a socialization assistant there. Awesome. Marlia, how did you hear about this call? Uh, from our um, uh, volunteer coordinator. Very cool. Is there is, is there something that you're super excited to hopefully hear about in the future? Uh, I'm I'm just uh, new, so I'm just waiting to hear what you have to say. Oh, that's a very good PR answer. You must be in marketing as well. Nice <laughs> and I see Cynthia from San Antonio. Cynthia, you want to unmute and say hello? I'm always like, are they fumbling to find the unmute or do they not have a microphone? But that's okay. Cynthia, it's- uh... Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, no, no, I can't hear you. I can't My hear call you. just hung up. I hit hang up instead of unmute. So I'm gonna call back in. We can hear you, Cynthia. Yeah, I can't hear you guys because my volume is all screwy on my laptop. Hold on a second. That, that's okay. We'll see you soon. But it is now 8.04 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hello, everyone. My name is Bobby Mann. I'm the Maddie's Human Animal Support Services Pilot Director. Super excited to be joining and sharing space with I'm you. I'm going to call back in. All right, Cynthia. We'll so see that you I again. use my phone's audio. Sounds good. All right. So it's Monday morning, we're all kind of grabbing that cup of coffee. And there's one other thing that really, really, really gets us going. And that's Mary Soros Rex over there. So Mary Soros, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick us off with some amazing announcements, which I'm very excited for and some additional motivation. All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Bobby. That was so cool. So let's go back in the time machine for a minute. October 2020. The CARE organization had created this pretty incredible implicit bias test for animal welfare professionals. If you've never taken it, you should really think about it. It really, um, it measures like our delay, our speed, our perceptions of ourselves. It's really, really a great test to take to think about how we deal with the world around us because we all have biases and prejudices. And looking at what those are can help us. The more we know about that, the more we can make better decisions and have better interactions with the world around us. So that was October, 2020. Let's fast forward to today. And the association has created a survey from their uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee 
to really capture your thoughts, feelings, and experiences in animal welfare. And it's a really important survey and you should encourage everyone to take it in your organization. And the deadline, it's gonna be open through end of day, June 23rd. So don't miss this opportunity to be part of this group of people that really get to talk about what their experiences have been in animal welfare. This is gonna create such an important baseline for our industry, something that we haven't had before. So if diversity, equity, inclusion continues to be something that your organization is concerned about, is working on, or wants to work on, this is a really good starting point. So please, I encourage you to do that. As Bobby said, as Mary uh, Soros and my dinosaurs, my dinosaurs are here to remind me that we can all become extinct. If these guys could become extinct, we could become extinct. And the way we make sure that that doesn't happen is being able to change and adapt. These surveys are a way for us to really think about what we do, how we do, and who we do it for in a completely different way. So please take the survey. Allison has posted a link to the association survey and the website. It'll take about 15 minutes to do it. I've taken it. There's some open-ended questions, but it's the cool thing is it's an opportunity to share your experiences, maybe things that you've never shared before, you can do it there. So with that, I'm out. Bobby, thanks so much for giving me this time for this important plug. Thanks, Mary. And I, I don't know, I, I sent some branding going around Mary Soros, at least while those stickers are up there. I really like it. Uh, let's open up some space for national updates. I also, you know, I see some, not just national organizations, but some amazing businesses in animal welfare that are coming to these calls. Uh, I see, uh, let's see, there's so many right now. So even if you're not a nonprofit and you're a business joining these calls that's providing services, we always welcome updates from you as well. Okay, I was looking for the link, but I'll wing it and drop it in later. It's Kathy from Canada. And uh, we had a great mini event last week, but we have another one coming in August, August 25th. So it's with respect to um, global climate change and animal welfare. And I encourage everybody to sign up once registration is open and I will for sure keep you posted. Thanks, Kathy. And give it 20 more seconds of silence for you to build up your courage, national folks. This is Lisa in Ohio. I missed what we're building up our courage for. Oh, just for national updates, Lisa. But uh, I'm definitely okay. going to shoot you a message and we'll, we'll hang out later for sure. Okay, hey, Bobby. Bobby, can I mention, um, we've got the Texas Unite uh, spring webinar series is continuing. Um, they've got webinars every Thursday for two more Thursdays coming up. Uh, and anybody signing up for the webinar series can uh, access both the recorded sessions and the live sessions that still have to go. It's only $49. Um, I'm gonna be speaking this Thursday. Uh, the seminar is called uh, canine skill building, uh, canine, canine behavior skill building, excuse me, I should know my own thing, communicating with canines. And um, as important as socialization is, and as important as dog training is, uh, what we get from our dogs and what we give to our dogs moment by moment basically comes down to communication. So we're going to go over posture, position, movement, uh, energy, uh, we're going to uh, cover the two golden rules and the five C's of canine communication, calm, clear, consistent, confident, and canine intuitive. Um, it's an hour and a half presentation, should be lots of fun. And, and please, you know, check out texasunites.com and you can see all the different seminars. This is the second year I've spoken for this group. They're awesome. They put on a very, very good show. And come next year, it should be live again in Austin. So thanks.
Thanks, Lynn. There's two things that I loved about that. One, with Texas Unites, I, what I love about this series that they're doing is they're trickling information to you. So it's not like you have to block off two days or three days of your calendar to try to get as much in. So I think as digital learning is becoming a little bit more difficult and our worlds are very full, I think it's a great strategy. Uh, I will echo what Mary said. Definitely check out the Best Friends Conference. I'm very honored to be speaking there. And the last thing, Lynn, I'm going to say is I love how you asked me permission and hopped right into it. That's that's called voluntold. I was voluntold to create space for you. So great, <laughs> great presentation. I love it. All right. Speaking of presentations, uh, we know a big part of the conversation today is animal services, field services, and how we are changing our relationship with our community to make sure that we are partnering and getting away from punitive punishment and getting much more into support. Uh, and a big, big part of that is the work that's happening at NACA, uh, the National Animal Care Association, Animal Control Association. And I'm super excited to have my dear friend, Jerrica Owen, Director of Partnerships and Programs with NACA here to share some amazing new training that they're working on and maybe some cool, cool grant opportunities. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. Make sure I do this right. Can you see the presentation? Looks good. Okay, so I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller. Okay. Good morning. Mm, Jerica, it left it left present mode. So if you want to hit present again. <laughs> All of our little faces are in the way. Okay. Um, Perfect. It's cutting off my notes. So, <laughs> or what? What's in the way, Jerica? Uh, just my notes. Oh no, no, sorry. What's blocking your notes? Oh, when I put it in presentation mode, it takes the whole uh, screen. It won't let me do half screen. Um, that's okay. We're gonna just keep on moving forward, right? So, first of all, good morning. Uh, thank you all for having me today. Uh, my name is Jerica Owen and I'm the Director of Partnerships and Programs for the National Animal Care and Control Association for NACA. Um, and I'm gonna take you through some exciting things happening with NACA, as well as our um, partners with Justice Clearinghouse, um, and then some pretty cool, exciting things coming up for NACA as well. Um, so just a little bit about NACA. Um, NACA envisions a world in which all animal care and control professionals are respected as essential public servants and receive consistent support, resources, and training, allowing them to be highly effective and compassionately achieve the highest quality for the animals and citizens in the community in which they serve. So with NACA, uh, we have a partnership with a Justice Clearinghouse. We refer to them as JCH. Uh, so if you hear me say that later on, that is what that means. Um, and Justice Clearinghouse is a just-in-time, um, on-demand platform that really supports uh, uh, police and fire and any uh, public servants. And so with more than 80,000 justice and public safety professionals in our community, the Justice Clearinghouse is the first organization to adopt an interdisciplinary approach to understanding and resolving the challenges. They offer a huge, huge variety of webinars. Uh, the webinars are free for uh, first view, and then after that, you'll be able to, um, if you wanted to become a member, and uh, they've got an individual subscription, as well as uh, group subscriptions as well. Um, I do have my wonderful friend, Christine, on the call from Justice Clearinghouse. So if there are any specific questions um, at the end, <clears throat> we can have her help answer those. Uh, I can't tell you how, how amazing these webinars are. There are professionals from every disciplinary um, across public safety that come and speak about all of the different issues. Um, and so it's really, really exciting. And I'll put the link in the chat uh, towards the end. So like I was telling you about the webinars, there are, um, there are tons and I'm so sorry, I don't have my notes now, so I don't have the exact number, um, but of those uh, webinars, 96 uh, of them are animal welfare related. And uh, the bullet, points on the top are the top uh, five that have um, the highest reviews and the highest ratings uh, and watches. So the first one, what your boss, what you really wish your boss knew, professionalism in an unprofessional world. 
So this is really interesting. Um, and they have a lot of things like this that are maybe necessarily not what you would think for animal welfare, um, but things that are hugely popular and things that really are gonna be supporting those uh, professionals uh, in the field as well as in the shelter as well. Um, and so the other ones are on there, pet friendly domestic violence shelters, as we know, um, with some of the Haas projects going on and the uh, keeping families and pets together, this type of programming and webinars is really impactful. Uh, we have another one called Avoiding Teeth and Bullets, also really impactful. Um, and then a couple of others. There's a lot of wildlife ones that are coming up. Uh, if you look on any of the, went down a little bit of a rabbit hole with some of the social media over the last couple of weeks, just looking to see what's out there. Um, what are the officers in the fields dealing with? Um, and it is very wildlife heavy. There's a ton of wildlife. Uh, we know it's baby season right now as well, um, but there's just so much uh, interesting wildlife out there. And so um, there's some really great resources to support. So with COVID, um, we know that you know COVID uh, has been a catalyst to really uh, change and pivot into some really unique and interesting ways. And one of the things that NECA and Justice Clearinghouse needed to do was to take those uh, trainings, the animal control officer trainings, and pivot from in-person to online. And so they created uh, an anim ACO1 and an ACO2. And I'll talk in a little bit about some of the ACO3 that's for, uh, currently a work in progress. Um, but ACO1 is a, an online, on-demand, uh, virtual training that is a certification for officers. And these are just a couple of the um, modules that you see listed in front of you. There are uh, about 20 modules in each ACO1 and ACO2. And uh, they're about 20 hours. And um, I personally have taken them. It's fantastic information. Uh, it was a, th this was, it's also been very successful. Um, and so, Let's see. So for ACO1, there are have been over 300 graduates. There are currently 1,100 enrollees currently going through the program now. In ACO2, there are 108 graduates, and there are currently about 300 people enrolled in ACO2. Um, at the end of the certification, there is a, an exam as well, the proctored um, exam that you do from your computer, and it's 100 questions. And upon completion, you'll get a, the ACOs will get a certificate and they will uh, also get a pin. So just a couple of the amazing upcoming learning opportunities from Justice Clearinghouse. Uh, seven, uh, July 15th, we've got prosecuting farmed animal cruelty. Um, I'll also put the link so you can register for these. Um, and again, if you watch them live, they are free. Um, after that, it goes into the resource library where you'll be a member uh, subscription membership to uh, to watch them. Um, so these are just a few. I think there are uh, 15 or so uh, in the queue for the next uh, for the rest of 2021, somewhere around there. Um, and there's all different types of stuff. You can see farm animal. Uh, there again, the wildlife. There is um, some translocation information. Um, data driven. There's a lot of amazing things out there that is really uh, helpful for field services, but also for shelter workers as well. Setting the standard. Um, and I apologize, this is when I really need my notes on, but I'm going to do my best. Um, there's currently no um, with police officers and with um, fire and with you know a lot of these public servant and public uh, professional uh, organizations and jobs, there is uh, there's a standard um, of of training and then anything you know state specific or um, uh, required by your jurisdiction is is a step above that. But there is that standard and no such standard really exists for animal control. So by these ACO1 and ACO2 trainings, um, NACA is working to really uh, help set that standard and to really fill that gap that helps to provide um, the baseline for animal control officers across the nation. So um, 
part of helping to get the word out there and get the message out there about the ACO1 and ACO2 trainings, as well as, as other free webinars that are coming up, um, NACA has a magazine and it's a digital magazine. It used to be in print, but it is now digital. And um, we are always accepting articles. So if anybody, I think I mentioned this a couple of Mondays ago uh, as my national update, but if anybody would like to submit articles, submitting articles is completely free. Um, we also have an option for advertising uh, space as well. But um, the, the Animal Control NACA magazine uh, is really focused to help you know, with articles and information that really helps support those in the field um, with anything that they might need to know or that's relevant and timely. Um, so I encourage you all to uh, subscribe to get the magazine as well. The future is bright. The future is so bright. I'm so excited. Um, a couple of cool things. Uh, so the first thing, ACO3. Um, we are currently working, NACA is working on a partnership with the University of Florida, which has the uh, veterinary forensics uh, lab and program. And we're working on an ACO3. So the idea is that it's going to be uh, somewhat of a hybrid approach. So it'll be the hands-on plus some virtual. Um, I don't have all the details yet. We're still in the uh, infant stages of trying to see what it's going to look like. Uh, but we're very excited that this project is moving forward. Um, and I also don't have a timeline. I don't want to say anything that might be unrealistic. But uh, just know that it's in the works and it's very exciting. So super happy to share that. With uh, Justice Clearinghouse, we're working on uh, some new certifications. We've got all kinds of ideas. And um, if there's a need out there, I just encourage you to email me or call me, text me. Um, we've got all kinds of different ideas on things that we know that people need, um, whether it's wildlife or dispatch or um, you know, a variety of different things. So we have all kinds of ideas and uh, just trying to stay relevant, trying to stay timely uh, and really fill the need. So if you feel that there's a need out there for something, please let me know. State association partnerships. So for NACA to really support those officers in the field and, and those doing the work, um, we know that their state associations are doing that as well. And so working together, um, right, this is how animal welfare right now, I'm, I just love where we're at as a, as a movement because we're all together and that makes me so happy. Um, and so we're working with those state associations. Uh, we are currently working with Cal Animals, which is the California State Association, um, to bring their humane law enforcement training, which only has um, on, uh, in-person options right now, uh, to work together towards creating a, an online version for them. So that is in the works. There's a lot of cool things happening, but that will help really uh, fill the need for those that need that training that either can't travel, uh, don't have the budget to travel, or possibly they're the only animal control officer and they can't travel. Um, and so really trying to fill that need. And so we're working with all the different state associations. Once we have that completed with California, uh, we'll be then able to take that same model and implement it at different um, agencies as well. Every state is a little bit different, but by building this template, we'll be able to adapt it um, and move forward with each of the different state associations. And then expanding partnerships, uh, making friends. I love, I love friends. <laughs> and so how can NACA work? Uh, we've, we've had lots of great conversations. I, I've met a lot of you uh, through different meetings and stuff and really just working. How can we work together? You know, like I said, one of the, my favorite things about where we're at as an industry right now is this space and the space that uh, allows us all to see each other at least twice a week, if not more, um, and just connect and, and work together and how can we work together more. Um, so it's also something we're doing. Speaking of working together, uh, Culture and Collaboration Council, the NACA Board of Directors, uh, recently voted to approve a culture and collaboration council. So this council will be made up of uh, field services and shelter operational professionals who are actually out there doing the work. And how can we as a group, um, you know, keep a pulse on the industry? How can we keep a pulse on the needs? What are the needs? Um, and so we're going to be looking for um, eight people to join a culture and collaboration council. Um, we're building the application uh, and some of the collateral right now, but you can look for this around August to come out. Uh, and if you're interested, I strongly encourage you uh, to put your th throw your name in the in the ring. Um, I'd love to have you as part of the 
Culture and Collaboration Council. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity to really have um, to, to have a group that you know is 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 working the the day to day. Okay, this is my exciting news. Um, everything's been exciting, but this is really exciting. Um, I cannot thank the ASPCA enough for their gratitude. Um, we are we are, we are so thankful uh, for their generosity. Um, they have approved funding for nearly a hundred um, scholarships for ACO1 and ACO2. And this is so exciting. That is potentially a hundred people who do not have access to training, who do not have access to get to you know, travel or anything. Um, and so these scholarships are gonna be so impactful and really helping to get those that need it the most. Um, and so starting July 1, we will be posting and sort of launching that um, this process. So it'll be an application process um, and the application will be built directly onto the website. So it reduces any barriers for those needing to print or anything like that. It'll be built directly in um, and we're just really excited. So anybody who has been interested in taking ACO1 or ACO2, um, there are some requirements in terms of those working in the field and that kind of stuff. So that'll all be posted on the website. Um, but I'm just, we're just so thankful uh, for the ASPCA and so uh, thrilled for their, um, their generosity to us and to, to the industry. So thank you to the A. Okay. Getting there. Uh, so join NACA. Come, come hang out. Let's play. Um, Kathy's in Canada. I love it. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're just rebuilding NACA's. Um, membership, we're working on engaging the members, not only through things like the collaboration council, um, but also just through, you know, again, those partnerships and helping to work on things that they need, they need help with, right, advocacy or things that they need um, support and talking to their leadership about all different things. Um, so strongly encourage you to join. It's $25 um, for an individual membership um, and that we have career posting, we have a calendar of events, um, working on continuing to increase and enhance those membership um, opportunities and really the, the value of membership. So um, reach out if you have any questions. I will put my uh, email in the chat. I think somebody already did. Uh, but just would love to have you as part of our uh, NACA family. And with that, I am done with my presentation, but I'm happy to take any questions. Who needs notes, Jerrica? You crushed <laughs> that presentation, sister. Loved it. Um, we do have time for questions. I will kick it off with the question that I have, uh, but feel free to use the chat and we'd love to call on you to ask your questions. So um, I know that you said that there will be some prerequisites for the uh, scholarships, but Jerrica, have you seen folks that are interested in getting into field services that maybe are working the front desk at a shelter that have been interested in taking some of these courses? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We have. Um, and I think that it's, it's a great, um, I don't know how many people start in field services, you know, field services see the worst of the worst. They are in very emotionally charged situations oftentimes. Um, and so I think, you know, starting in a, a different position is, is oftentimes a stepping stone into field services. Um, yeah, absolutely. Austin, we'll give it uh, just another minute for the chat, but my, my question is a little larger than just this specific program, but you're stepping into a new role with NACA. Uh, you've been there for a few months now, and, and a big part of it is partnerships and collaboration. So what has, uh, coming from the amazing San Diego Humane Society and doing a lot of work there, what has been exciting about moving to a national role, and what are some of your goals? Okay, thanks for putting me on the spot. <laughs> Um, oh my goodness, let's see. It has been a, a transition. It's been a huge transition. Um, luckily, it's been smooth, thankfully, to all of my San Diego Humane family and all of the NACA family. Um, you know, I think it's, gosh, there's so many goals. There's so many things that I think um, that NACA can do to really support those field services officers um, and again, the shelter as well, right? I think that there's a huge um, there tends to often be a gap between the two. There tends to, you know, they're often siloed from each other somehow, some different way. Um, even, you know, huge, large progressive, uh, shelters have that sort of divide. And so one of my goals would really to be to help kind of build 
um, and bridge that gap. I think that that's so necessary, um, so important. They work together, but oftentimes they have just a little bit of um, just a little bit of a gap. And so I think that that's definitely a huge goal is to work to build that gap. Um, and then also just to help build up the profession and, and the, the professionalism of the field services officer. Across the country, there are you know, certain states and certain agencies that have a really high standard for, the, for their um, officers. And then there are other states and other agencies that they have none. Um, and so how can we level this playing field a little bit and ensure that everybody has uh, the safe, the, the standard training, the, you know, the tools and resources to be safe when they're out there, um, and all of, you know, just everything they need to do their job effectively, but also to be very safe, because it's a very, um, it can be a very dangerous job, you know, in the shelter as well as in the field, but you know, in the field, um, oftentimes they're in those very dangerous, highly emotionally charged situations. Yeah, I really appreciate you all focus on getting people the tools to be successful. There's a great question from Crystal <clears throat> about her or she are they being a foster based rescue and would they benefit from being a part of NACA? That's a really great question. Absolutely, yes. Um, but I need probably need to let's connect. I'd love to chat with you, uh, Crystal, offline and just kind of learn a little bit more about what you do and if there's a way that we can really help support. Um, but definitely just off the top of my head, any of the training uh, that offer, is offered through Justice Clearinghouse and then the community as well through NACA, I think would be really impactful, uh, but I'd love to connect with you. And I love it. And I love that there's another NACA board member who's just crushing the chat as well. Yeah, I got to put my, my I got to put my two cents in, Bobby. You Thank know. you, Spencer. <laughs> I love it. Jerrica, uh, so grateful for you being here and just sharing some of the amazing work that you're doing over at NACA. Uh, we look forward to hearing some updates about some of the scholarships and uh, maybe drop your email again in the chat for folks that have questions. Uh, but let's move on to our next presentation. So so excited to hear about the work that's going on for the national movement of NACA. And I'm also very excited to have Spencer Conover here, who is the assistant director of Pascal County Animal Services to talk a little bit about what they're doing in animal control and also the volunteer culture they're creating around it. Yeah, hello everyone. I am Spencer Conover, as Bobby alluded to, assistant director of Pasco County Animal Services, about 20 minutes north of Tampa in Florida. Um, you know, we got Disney World, we got alligators. You guys are all jealous, I know. Um, I, I want to start off first and foremost, uh, along with, with Jarek, I sit on the board of directors for NACA, the National Animal Care and Control Association, and I joined the board in October of 2020, and I was convinced by one of our colleagues, hey man, join the board, we could really use you, and when I got in, uh, NACA was a mess, y'all, and financially wasn't stable, and there was a lot of talks of other stuff going on and are we gonna be sustainable? And what that board has done outside of me, I'm just, a, I'm just an observer, what that board has done to, to help animal control officers uh, and organizations like ours throughout the country over the last several months has been very, very impactful. The biggest part of it has been, we had this great direction now, we had all these great ideas, we had support, but we had to find a way to implement it. And that's where Jerrica came in. She was that last piece that we needed as an organization to make sure that NACA's mission uh, could be fulfilled. And so Jerrica has done such a fantastic job for the organization over the last several, several time here. Um, I wanna say months, but I don't even think you've been with the organization for months. It's been like weeks and you're already, you're already crushing it. And uh, we absolutely love having Jerrica on board and, and please reach out to her because she is gung ho to get people signed up and get people uh, working together as that is in her, her job description of partnerships. And so thank you Jerrica for what you're doing for NACA and thank you all for supporting that organization. But I wanna chat with you all today about volunteers working with animal control officers. Yes, I said it, volunteers can work with animal control officers. It can happen. Uh, our organization has been a Save 90 or a no kill organization as a government municipal shelter for about eight years or so now. And we finally reached that mission in, in 2019. We achieved 91% save rate overall. Um, but back in 2019, uh, as, as recently as that, you could come to our organization, you can volunteer as a dog walker, or you could clean cat cows. And that was it. That's all you could do. And uh, we took it upon ourselves as a leadership team during that time uh, to reach out. One of our county core values is, is innovation. And we, we pride ourselves on that here in Pasco County. And we knew that we had to expand our volunteer program. We were very blessed um, through the pandemic, through all of this to receive, we haven't had a lot of budget cuts. Uh, we've had a flat budget, um, but what that means is our workload is increasing 
and we're not getting any additional help. And so we had to really leverage the help that we did have. And we had this great opportunity to partner with Best Friends Animal Society uh, and part of their service enterprise certification through Points of Light. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a service enterprise certification is, is leveraging your volunteer support to optimize and ensure that it is premier and truly helping your organization. And we were able to, to partner with them to optimize our volunteer program. And through that 18 month process, we were able to get certified. We went from two uh, jobs that you could do, like I said, walking dogs, cleaning cat kennels, it's all you could do, uh, to now we have over 40 job descriptions. Of, or of people that can come in, volunteer with our organization. Uh, we have folks doing adoptions, we have adoption counselors, we have folks that are helping in our medical suite, um, we have folks that are cleaning surgery equipment, helping animals recover from surgery, and yes, helping animal control and our animal control officers in the field. Uh, it's absolutely incredible. What we basically did was, part of the service enterprise certification was, one of the steps was sitting back and saying, hey, what is the crappiest part of your job, and can we have volunteers do that instead of you? Right. And that's kind of what we looked at. And you can all do that without the certification. You don't need best friends telling you what to do. You don't need points of light telling you what to do. What are the crappiest parts of your job? And can you guys have volunteers do that instead of you? So we looked at our animal control officers and said, yep, absolutely. One of which we have three job descriptions with animal control officers now. Um, it used to be very, very enforcement based. And one thing that we've loved in partnering with Haas uh, has been now we are very, very community based. Our animal control officers are focused on keeping animals in their homes, not bringing them into the shelter. Let you know a secret, it's a lot easier for the officers too. And the, you know, the old school officer mentality of nope, enforcement, I'm gonna bring it in. Our officers have found 100% that it is so much easier to try to keep those animals in their homes, in the community, saves them a lot of time, saves us a lot of money and helps keep families happy. With our volunteers, um, we had to first look at what our restrictions are, right? We are county government municipal shelter. We had to look at our risk department, right? I had to go to risk and say, hey, risk department, I'm gonna put a volunteer in an animal control van and have them go pick up animals, right? So we worded it this way and it worked for us. I currently have volunteers going into a kennel with a dog they don't know that got here an hour ago that we don't know anything about and walking it around our property. Is that more risky or less risky than driving a van? right? Wording it that way, they were like, bam, you're on it. You're on it, right? Now, the, the risk I took in taking that and discussing it with the risk was them saying, oh man, that's too dangerous too. Now you have no volunteer program. But it didn't work out that way. It ended up working out for us. So the one of the big volunteer programs that we have with our animal control officers is our, we call it our officer Uber, right? What our officers do nowadays is we have 750 square miles in our county. It's a fairly big county. We only have six animal control officers that, that um, patrol that area. So what happens a lot of time is you go to a call, you work it for 20 minutes, you get in your van, you ride it up for 20 minutes, and then you spend the next 20 minutes driving to the next call, right? And so you get an hour, you can do about one call. What we have our officer Ubers do is actually while that animal control officer is sitting in the passenger seat, writing up the call, the volunteer is driving already to the next call, right? And so you're increasing the amount of calls that you can get to on any given day, it's absolutely incredible. The biggest benefit of that particular program that we didn't realize was going to happen as a result of that is, I don't know how many of you guys raise your hands, animal control officers drive around by themselves all day, right? And it gets pretty freaking boring. Uh, our officers just like having somebody to talk to. How about that? You know, these volunteers, they sign up, they're passionate about the community, they're passionate about helping people, they're passionate about helping animals. And that is absolutely incredible that these officers now have somebody to talk to that is that are equally as passionate about helping their community. Officer Ubers have been a tremendous help for us. Uh, they go through the same uh, process to become a volunteer and be, with that volunteer role that our officers do in the qualifications for the county. They take a defensive driving course, they go through a background check, they have to provide proof of insurance, all of that. So we're covering our, our ground as far as risk is concerned, as far as county purchasing is concerned, all of those different departments. And we're ensuring the safety of the officer and that officer Uber. Knock wood, we've only had one incident where at the shelter, a volunteer backed into a, a supply shed. Uh, that was our only casualty so far, knock wood but it has been absolutely incredible, absolutely beneficial. Another role that we have with our animal control uh, uh, volunteers is animal control dispatch. We have over 45,000 calls that come into our animal control officers every year. And it gets routed through our county customer service department. County customer service will write up that call and then send it to our dispatcher. We only have one, we only have one dispatcher. And so poor Val is working all day, every day, trying to dispatch these officers to the right call, ensuring that the calls are written up well. 
And so what we did was we had people in the community say, hey, I want to help with that. Uh, very uh, easy training process. You understand the system very, very easily. And we actually have volunteers come in and dispatch officers to, call, to animal control calls, which is absolutely incredible. It's a huge help to Val, a huge help to the dispatch team. And it once again, helps animal control officers get to calls faster, which has been a huge benefit for all of our roles. Last but not least, is literally our animal control assistant. This is someone that is with our organization as a volunteer that is, has their own animal control van and they are out doing animal control calls. Now, with that being said, I'll put the caveat on a lot of our calls are investigations based. There is a level of risk and there is stuff you need to know. But some of our calls literally guys are going and picking up really healthy, friendly stray dogs and you don't need to have a master's degree to do that. And so what we do is we leverage some of that volunteer support to help with those nuisance calls to be able to free up the animal control officers to do longer in-depth investigations. What we find is a lot of those times with those nuisance calls, we're spending so much time doing those, we're having to burn through the investigation so fast, we're missing stuff or we're not doing the community a good service. And so by taking those nuisance calls, those ACAs, those animal control assistants can go out and they can pick up stray healthy friendly dogs. They can release dogs uh, and cats from bike quarantines. Hey, are you healthy? Are you alive? Cool, no more quarantine. Right. And so little things like that, that's very, very simple for a volunteer to be able to do with a little bit of training. Absolutely easy to do. And we're happy to have our volunteers helping with that. Uh, the only other, uh, you know, when we interview these uh, officers and uh, potential volunteers, they're going through a process that is very similar to what you would go through if you got hired here. This is a volunteer position where we are definitely looking for quality over quantity. We don't have dozens and dozens of dozens of these volunteers. Right now, currently we have three, uh, I believe, animal control assistants. We have one or two dispatch volunteers, and then we have a handful of officer Ubers. Like I said, we only have six officers. So for the officer Ubers, I don't need 50 people to drive around the county with these officers. I just need a handful. And so we go through the full interview process with these guys. They're gonna interview and sit down with our field services supervisor. Uh, we get a lot of, um, interest in these roles. And then every once in a while, these volunteers sit down with the field services supervisor and we explain what we actually do. And it's like, hey, that's not the best fit for me. You know, these some of these volunteers have seen one too many episodes of Animal Cops Houston, and they think they're going to be kicking doors down and rescuing hoarding cases. And unfortunately, a lot of our work is driving and writing on a computer. And so we really need the help with that. We, we go through the interview process and the ones that stick around have been unbelievably beneficial. We've seen officers get to calls faster. We've seen officers happier with morale in the field when they have somebody to talk to. And we've seen dispatch animal control officers get to areas much quicker, which is absolutely incredible. And we love that. We've also seen the backside of this is we are now training the next level of animal control officers in our community. We are in Pasco County, just south of us is Hillsborough County. That's where Tampa, Florida is. We've lost one of our animal control assistants to an animal control job in Hillsborough County. And we love that because we got to train that person and we got to put them into the field of animal control and we got to be a part of that. And so we absolutely love that. We've lost uh, volunteers to other animal services positions before. And we, once again, we absolutely love that and we encourage that and we love being a part of that. And so. I don't wanna take up too much more of the time. I definitely wanna leave it open for questions. The only other thing I'll say about this is cheap plug. I am doing a presentation on this particular topic at the Best Friends Conference this week, if anybody's attending that. I think it's 12.30 Eastern on Wednesday, I believe. And I'll have sessions available individually if people wanna, you know, if you don't want the group setting, the group Zoom setting to ask questions or anything. If you guys wanna meet with me, I have like time slots. I think they have set up where we can talk about officers. We can talk about volunteering. Uh, we can talk about the kick-ass work we're doing here with Haas. Uh, we can talk about anything, but I definitely want to open up for questions because I know a lot of times when I talk about this stuff, um, people are like, nope, there's no way. My county would never allow me to do animal control officers with volunteers or my, uh, my county would never allow me to do progressive human support services with animal control. And so I want to open it up because guess what, Jack, we're doing it. You know, and people say all the time, you can't do it. Come to Pasco, man. I'll show you around. I got a great sushi spot around the, around the corner and we'll check out animal control doing great things while you're here. But I'll open it up to questions. Thank you guys for your time, for sure. Thanks, Spencer. Love your energy. Um, I'll get it kicked off with a quick question. Um, are your staff uh, union employees? And if so, how did you get around getting volunteers to do the exact same jobs they are? Excellent question. Excellent question. They are. And they are, and, and our, our county is heavily involved with the union. I will say this, our county does have a great relationship with the union and they, we are very, very uh, grateful that our volunteer program is, is endorsed by the union and, and they, they, are, they are okay with it. I will admit, I am not 
that versed in the union stuff. And so if you guys have specific questions about that, how do we get around it? Here's the issue we're facing. Shoot it my way. I'll put my email in the uh, in the chat here and I will check with our HR department because they handle all of that stuff for us. They're a tremendous part of our organization, our HR department, and we love partnering with them. Let me throw my uh, email in the chat here. Boom. And if you guys have any questions about the union stuff, I'm happy to shoot that to our HR department for sure. I know that's a problem for a lot of a lot of agencies uh, around the country and in Canada. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> Stacy, I see that you dropped a uh, comment in the chat about return to home and utilizing volunteers with officers. Do you want to maybe share some of the ideas and, and what you might be thinking? Yeah, well, when you were talking about that, I was thinking that you could have, you had it the other way. You had the volunteer driving and the officer doing work and reporting while driving. And I was kind of thinking if an officer had a, like a neighborhood beat, there could be, and they found a dog. I know it can be time consuming to go kind of door to door to door, checking to see who the dog might belong to. If you, the officer could kind of continue their small beat and the, and the volunteer could be out doing the door to door to door, and then they could reconnect. Absolutely. And we want to leverage our technology to be able to do that too. As we partner with Petco Love Lost and things like that, we're definitely leveraging that volunteer support. I'll go one further. The dog's already at the shelter. If somebody calls up through any of these social media apps or through our phone service, service and says, hey, that's my dog, but I can't get down there until Friday to get it. No, man, I got a whole bunch of volunteers. I'll drive it to your house. I don't want your dog in my shelter anymore, right? So where we have animal control officers and animal control assistants and animal control Uber drivers, where we only have a handful of those, we have about 40 or 50 people in our volunteer base that we've signed up through the county to actually operate county vehicles. And so when we have uh, volunteers needing to go pick up TNVR cats for surgery, we have volunteers doing that as well. We have stray dogs that need to get back to their owner. Hey, an officer can't get out there for two hours. No, man, I'll call Ben from down the street and Ben can drive your dog back out, uh, you know, 45 miles away. And so it, it's, it's really good to leverage that volunteer support uh, to be able to, to be able to do that. So great, great point. Great point. We want to increase that too, of, you know, the, the officers are so bogged down. Like I, I'm envisioning all of the hot stuff of, yeah, man, you, you have to knock on 10 doors before you bring that dog back to the shelter, right? Just to see who it is. And unfortunately, right now, we don't have the time to do that. But man, can we leverage that volunteer time to be able to get that done? Heck yeah, absolutely. That's an amazing strategy, Stacey. I'd, lo I'd love to see you pilot that in San Diego and let us know how it goes. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'm going to just uh, mute and allow some space if anybody has one more question for Spencer. Otherwise, I, I can close it off with a question as well. Come on, y'all. This is Lisa in Ohio. As someone who has animal skills and has find, you know, stops for every dog that's loose and used to work closely with the dog ward to get them to him and volunteer my time, I appreciate what you're saying. It's, it's greatly needed here. Uh, now they don't, a lot of dogs they don't even go out on because they don't have anybody to go get them or to, it's a rural area. And I was just expected as an individual to hold on to that dog if and when they could come get it and they limited his hours. So I said, I'm, I'm older now. I'm on a disability kind of lifestyle. And I, I re resent highly that you expect me to not only, not only did I volunteer to contain the dog that somebody's pets running loose, but you expect me to hold it and keep it. But anyway, I digress. I can see how great this is to do. I've done it to some degree or other over the years to help my local dog warden, but I see the need and I appreciate it. And I'll look into this a lot and see yeah. if we can get some more done here. And, and, and I can re-engage with the dog warden so that I'm not volunteering something that is dysfunctional and that yeah. I literally will say it will help any dog in need, but then I'm often left holding the bag with a dog that is cold and hungry and I'm putting in my truck to warm up going, now what am I supposed to do with this dog? I don't have, you know, the ability to bring him into my house and I'm stuck. And, but anyway, so there's a lot of good caring people out there that try to intercede. And I'm always about safety, number one for people and the animals, but also for inter intervening as quickly as possible to avert any kind of disaster or theft of the dog or uh, traffic accident or anything. It's important to get on it ASAP. Yeah, so thank absolutely. you. I'll look into this yeah, more. Absolutely. And, and Lisa, I'll bring, up, I'll, bring, I'll bring up a good point. And obviously, 
by not being able to provide that resource in your area, you're, you, you word it in a way in which it's probably a lack of resources on behalf of the organization. But in reality, I, you know, I got a pretty decent budget. I got some officers. I don't want the dog either, right? And so when, when right. we, have, we have a town, we have a town called Zephyr Hills. Zephyr Hills is about 35 miles. Takes about 45 minutes to 50 minutes to, to get to my shelter. We get stray dog calls in Zephyr Hills all the time. I don't want dogs coming from Zephyr Hills because the odds of them being found by their owner once they get to my shelter are so damn low. They do not go right. home. And so when, when we, now that's not, I don't resent your warden for not providing those resources to you, but I wish you would provide different resources to be able to help those dogs get back home, right? And does that make sense? Yes, I, I, I hear that we're, you want them to get back home. Um, I'm thinking um, there's, there's a little high drug use in, in certain Ohio communities, high, higher in other states. So you've actually got people that, you know, are just throwing, uh, yeah. our dog warden's great and there's a lot of goodwill in the community. Uh, but occasionally in a bad area of town, you need, the police won't come out unless a dog's bitten somebody. And the dog warden oftentimes is on the other side of the county. And it's, um, I'm yeah. left to just, intercede for the situation in my like, own little like area said, like bobby said at the top of the call definitely get with him offline to see what haas can do okay um, well, but I, I really okay go ahead, and spencer i want to i want to jump in here i think lisa thank you so much and i and i think it's this is such an important conversation and i want to slow down a little bit just to create some space to really just digest this right because this is someone that is trying to do well for the animals in their community um you know there this is someone who is basing a lot of their experiences off of their lived experiences, some of the things that they've seen. Um, and we're having conversations about good and bad parts of our community, right? And, and I feel like it's coming from a good intention place. And Lisa, I'm so grateful that you're here. And I think what is gonna be beautiful about being a part of this community uh, is that we're gonna learn, and you hopefully will see from a lot of the amazing presentations, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's no longer them versus us or good versus bad. Uh, we are a community. And I think the more that we're able to communicate and the more that we're able to bring folks to the table, because I guarantee you in that same part of the community where you're saying that there might be people that uh, maybe have addiction issues, I guarantee you there's just as many ambassadors, if not more, that are doing the same type of work that you're doing uh, that just haven't had a chance to have a seat at the table yet. So my advice to you is one, definitely continue to develop those relationships. Let's connect offline. Uh, let's actually have you go to those same communities and let's go talk to the church leaders. Let's go talk to the local barbershop. Let's go talk to the corner market and let's actually find those folks that are really doing the work. And I guarantee you, it is gonna surprise you that there are just as many people that care about these animals that are living in those communities um, as there are that are volunteering at your local shelter. But um, just a reminder, folks, this is what these calls are for, is to create space and to learn more about each other and what we're dealing with. And uh, Spencer, I wanted to toss it over to you if there's anything else that you wanted to say before closing out. No, I just really like going back to it of whether, you know, the, one of the great things I've learned about this community that you all have built through Haas is that whether you're a nonprofit or a government shelter, you can do it, man. You can do all this stuff. We're, we're a government shelter running animal control, doing nonprofit private programs, and it works vice versa. You know, you can help keep stray pets in their homes if you're a nonprofit shelter through these volunteer support. And so just never say never. Keep going. Keep trying. And like I said, if you guys need anybody, if you got a board that doesn't want to do it or you got people in the community who don't want to do it, tell them to come call me. I'll, I'll show them how it's working. Thanks, Spencer. We always love your energy and also Jerrica with NACA for sharing some great national information updates. We're all really looking forward to those ASPCA grants. I'm sure a lot of people are going to utilize those. Uh, and again, thank you all for sharing this space today. Uh, if I can make my one ask, it's definitely to fill out the association's DEI survey uh, and to close us out for the day and to give us about five minutes back in our lives. I'm going to toss it over to Mary Smith. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jerrica. Thank you, Spencer. That was really great. I feel very energized for the week ahead, and I'm very excited about the Best Friends Conference. If you haven't signed up for it yet, please do. And don't forget, July 9th to 11th is the ASPCA Cornell Maddie Shelter Medicine Conference. It's really going to be three days of some incredible information. So we've got lots of opportunities this summer 
to really just expand our knowledge base in unprecedented ways. So thank you all. Have a great week. See you soon. Bye.